Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the entire history of the Asia-Pacific War, 1937 to 1945, and all the major events that led up to it. I, as you can see if you're watching this visually, am joined by my two feathery co-hosts who are gorging upon cashews which have been supplied to them by your gracious views. So thank you. If you've not already done so, please hit that like and subscribe button as it means a lot to this very small channel. So, after many commentators had begged me to do a piece on something involving Vietnam, I have decided, because I have just completed a Asia during World War I series, that I would do something to finally give back to these commentators. And as I was working on it, I actually fell quite far down a rabbit hole. While I was beginning with what happened during World War I for the Vietnamese, I actually thought I should probably do most of Southeast Asia. As you can imagine, numerous Southeast Asian nations were involved during World War I, and I can't possibly do them all. So I had to pick and choose. This episode will be on Vietnam, Cambodia, and the Kingdom of Siam during World War I. Over 1,723 Asians came to the battlefields of Europe and the Middle East between 1914 and 1919. This came at a time when the governments and societies of Asia were facing an onslaught of Western imperialism and the imposition of unequal treaties. At the outbreak of World War I, Vietnam was a French protectorate and part of French Indochina. When France entered World War I, they began to press gang thousands of volunteers for service in Europe, and this led to considerable social upheaval, such as rioting in places like Cochin, China. France put into service 92,411 Vietnamese. To be accepted, a volunteer had to pass a medical examination and be at least 1.5 meters tall. Similar to recruiting done in many other countries, men were rejected for various reasons such as eyesight or hearing problems, malnutrition, deformities, and so on. Most of the men that were rejected would not be released but instead placed into labor corps. Each recruit received a bonus of 200 francs and a monthly salary. Their families would receive a monthly allowance. If they died during the war, their wife and children under 18 years of age would receive their pension. Similar to the millions of young men in the rest of the world, many Vietnamese initially were eager to sign up. Stories told in the letters of the first round of volunteers who left for France in 1915 inspired their desire to fulfill Mok Sang Ho, a dream of adventure. Their stories described majestic churches, tall monuments, paved streets, large ships and shops, and wealthy residential areas in France. Many were attracted by the terms of employment listed on the Yit T, notice boards or official announcements, posted in the communal centers around the country. It promised bonuses, family allowances, pensions, honorary titles of the Mandarinate system, posthumous honors, and an exemption from the head tax, which was a great relief for poor peasant families. Pictures showed Vietnamese soldiers posing with French soldiers and officers, implying that if they joined the colonial army, they would have allied soldiers for Ban Dong Ming, comrades, and French officers for Ban Tong Ching, fellow cabanons. Thus it all seemed a bright future for the volunteers, prosperity and an elevation of social status and racial equality. Poverty was the main motivation for peasants to volunteer, especially in Tonkin and Annam, where the population density was very high. Prior to World War I, and even during 1915 to 1916, there were many natural disasters, like a series of floods and droughts, which led to famines, unemployment, and destitution. In France, the soldiers formed 18 battalions of the colonial infantry known as les Bataillons de l'Infanterie Coloniale comprising four combat battalions and 14 labor battalions. These battalions provided support to France, in the Balkans and in the Middle East. On the front lines, these battalions were often broken up into small units and attached to different regiments of the French army. According to historian Maurice Rive, the first Indochinese conflict of World War I was when crew members of the Musquette squared off against the German cruiser SMS Emden on October the 29th of 1914. Three Vietnamese died in the sea battle and could be counted as the first victims of the Great War for Indochina. For soldiers who had looked forward to having an exciting adventure, they got a lot more than they bargained for. 
two battalions of the Vietnamese soldiers who would serve in France. For the 7e and 21e Bataillon de Marche Indochinois, they landed in Marseille on February the 16th of 1916 and underwent training at Fréjus until April of 1917 and were soon sent to the front. In France, the winters were much harsher and colder than those in Tonkin and Annam. According to one sergeant, Fung, it was so cold that saliva immediately froze after it was spat on the ground. The chill of winter pierces one's heart. When the Vietnamese arrived at the front lines, many immediately requested to go into combat. They thought shooting the enemy was going to be easy. One only had to aim at the targets and squeeze the trigger. The 4e Compagnie saw action with the 12th Infantry Division during the Second Battle of N on the Chemin des Dames on May the 5th to the 7th of 1917. They were following up the regiment's attacks and tasked with resupplying the forward troops, consolidating trenches, and organizing captured territory. Over 150 Vietnamese were captured by Germans at the Battle of Chemin des Dames in May of 1918. When the Ministry of War tried to locate them, they found out that they had been sent to labor camps in Romania and Africa, and that most of them had died. In June of 1918, the 4e Compagnie were in the trenches in the Vosges where they were repulsed by intense German attacks. This was followed up by two attacks in October at Clove, and by the time of the armistice, they found themselves stationed in Rennes. One Vietnamese soldier of the 4e Compagnie recounted, Although dead bodies lay in the heaps, the enemies kept on fighting and killing each other with grenades, shells, and poison gas. Therefore, living in the trenches was like living in a cemetery. The 21e Bataillon de Marche Indochinois was formed consisting of 1,200 Vietnamese, 241 Europeans, and 21 officers on December the 1st of 1916. From May to July of 1917, they served in the frontline trenches of the Vosges, moving in August to the area of Reims. They were returned to the Vosges to hold positions in the area of the Montigny until the end of the war. In the Macedonian front, such as at Salonika, many colonial troops were placed within battalions. There were Tunisians, Algerians, Senegalese, Madagascarians, and four Indochinese, of which two were Vietnamese. The premier and deuxième combat battalions. According to J. Bosch, the Comptroller General of Indochinese troops, some French soldiers in Verdun, Argonne, and Champagne abused and were hostile towards Vietnamese soldiers. Like most of the colonial forces, the Vietnamese faced racism and they would even develop their own stereotypes of the French. Vietnamese soldiers, after seeing the heavy losses for the French, ridiculed the French soldiers' inability to win battles. They had only one-tenth of the Germans' talent and the Germans were much more superior. If heaven fights them, it would lose, too. Overall, the French military commanders had nothing but praise for their Vietnamese soldiers. In August of 1918, General Hippolyte Alphonse Pinet wrote that he was satisfied with their performance and their excellent demonstration of military codes of behavior during the battles at Chemin des Dames. On the 29th of August, 1918, General Paul Renier wrote that the Vietnamese soldiers had risen up to meet the occasion and had executed their jobs with great skill and in good spirit. He recalled, When being attacked by Austrian troops, who were far superior in artillery and in number, they pushed them back without ceding one inch of ground. Colonel Pham Van Lung was awarded the Croix de Guerre, and was promoted because he did not hesitate to attack the Germans by surprise on one of his patrol missions. De Hue Phi was one of the first Vietnamese aviators and fighter pilots. He rose up to the rank of captain. He fought in the Battle of the Somme, where he was killed. He was posthumously made a Chevalier de la Légion of Honor for being a courageous and spirited officer who gloriously fell while leading his company to assault the German trenches. Air Force Lieutenant De Hue was promoted to captain for carrying out a dangerous mission and bringing back valuable information for command headquarters. Captain Pham was rewarded with a medal for fighting off an enemy assault and for taking German prisoners. Hundreds of others received military decorations for their bravery and courage and for their sacrifices while fighting the Germans. It is estimated that over 12,000 Vietnamese perished during World War I. Before the war, many Vietnamese viewed the French as belonging to a superior race, but by the end of the war, their perception had diminished. 
They no longer viewed themselves as inferior to the Frenchmen, because they now had fought battles on par with the French. Fung, a soldier of the 52nd Battalion at Grasse, realized, France is not an extraordinary country, and neither were its people. In Vietnam, Frenchmen ruled the Vietnamese people, but when they returned to France, they were but laborers, pulling coal wagons and scrapping mud off their shoes. Some Vietnamese serving as guards in occupied Germany saw how some of the French treated the Germans and empathized with the Germans. One soldier's report read, The French oppressed the Germans in the same way they have the animats. Many Vietnamese went into the war uneducated and poor. By the time the war ended, they had been trained in modern warfare strategy, tactics, and weaponry. They became a force to be reckoned with back home and became natural leaders. Through their contacts with Europeans and their writings, many acquired current ideas of national autonomy and revolutionary ideology. What would soon emerge was a Vietnamese national movement, though it would take many years. Vietnam would overcome the yoke of French colonialism through bitter revolutionary wars. Indochina would supply around 30% of France's colonial forces alongside contingents of Senegalese, Madagascans, Moroccans, and Chinese totaling around half a million. While the lion's share of the Indochinese were Vietnamese, Cambodians also made up a single combat battalion. On May the 1st of 1916, the 1st Battalion of Cambodian Soldiers, the 20e Bataillon de Terriers Indochinois, proudly set out for France. As they departed for France from Saigon, the Cambodian volunteers were offered a spectacular official salute for their bravery. For many, it was the first time they even set foot on a ship, much less leave their natal provinces. They arrived in Marseille and soon set out for Fréjus for basic training. Many would serve as frontline units on the Western Front, such as at the Battle of Verdun, in the Vosges, and the mountains of Alsace, and the Chemin des Dames in Asle. Cambodians also fought in the Balkans, particularly the Macedonian battlefront. Cambodia was called on to provide 1,000 infantrymen and 2,500 workers to go to France. By April the 7th of 1916, the number of volunteers was around 1,015. To help induce conscription of Cambodians, the Cambodian royal family was used. With the permission of King Sisawath Monevang, seven royal princes were inducted into the 20e Bataillon de Tireilleuses d'Indochinois for service in France. In 1916, a revolt occurred which brought tens of thousands of peasants to Phnom Penh to petition King Sisowath for a reduction in taxes. Since 1912, large-scale road-building programs have been launched involving the mobilization of many café laborers. Another key component was the resentment for the military recruitment for France's war in Europe. At the epicenter of the revolt, over 100,000 peasants marched upon the capital. This led the resident superior François Boudin to violently crack down on protesters, causing many deaths. In a document in the National Archives of Cambodia from 1916, it outlined the benefits for soldiers. A volunteer who enlists got a bonus of $80, with $20 paid at a time of the commitment, $60 two days before their embarkment, and a daily balance of $0.24. Cents. Workers were given a $10 bonus, daily wage of $0.30, cents, with a premium bonus ranging from $0.10 to $0.30 cents for every working day. Around 2,500 Cambodian volunteers came to France as laborers, and it should be noted most Cambodian casualties occurred in armament facilities because the factory laborers did not have the same medical care as the soldiers. Generally, the Cambodians were noted for their good behavior, fierce soldierly looks, and their beautiful attitudes. They left an excellent impression and memory everywhere that they traveled. One volunteer Thierreya, named Nun from Preven province, was killed on July the 28th on the Alsace front and was awarded the Croix de Guerre, citing his courage as a brave tirailleur who stayed brave under violent bombardment, killed in the accomplishment of his duty. One veteran who returned home, Kim T, would later join the colonial service during the Pacific War. He then would find himself in a Japanese-sponsored cabinet and became governor of Kampo province. He was a pro-monarchist, but also a pro-independence politician. In 1919, the mayor of Phnom Penh formed a contest for the erection of a commemoration monument for those who died in France. On February the 14th of 1925, the monument was finally inaugurated. Unfortunately, this monument was torn down during the Khmer Rouge period. 
but the large bronze elephants that flanked either side of the monument can be found at the entrance of the National Museum today. In 1914, Siam faced a number of challenges. While it was not a colony, its sovereignty was certainly not secure. Its status was dependent in a large part on the policies of its colonial neighbors, Britain and France. It had been forced to concede territory to them only a few years earlier, such as during the Franco-Siamese War of 1893 and with the Anglo-Siamese Treaty of 1909. Alongside the loss of territory, Siam was forced to abide by unequal treaties. When World War I broke out, it began to disrupt foreign trade, such as the shipping routes between Siam and Europe. This in turn caused a sharp decline in Siam's economy. Bangkok had a sizable community of Western diplomats and businessmen. The British were dominant, but others all vied for political and economic influence over Siam's mining, timber, shipping, and infrastructure development. Siam did not view Germany as a colonial power in Southeast Asia, and therefore had a different relationship with her compared to Britain or France. German shipping lines dominated Bangkok, and German technology was widely purchased and used in Siam. When the war broke out, the Siamese government issued a royal proclamation on August the 6th of 1914 of neutrality. Siam simply had no stake in the war. However, for the next three years, this position of neutrality became quite difficult to uphold. Bangkok became a propaganda battleground for over three years. Germany, Britain, and France all continuously vied for Siam to join their own camp. More and more news spread of German actions during the war, such as the unprecedented mass killings and the use of chemical warfare. Both sides wanted the strategic alliance and commercial benefit of the only market in the Far East that was yet to be colonized, Siam. Over nine German commercial vessels sought refuge in Siam's neutral waters, anchored behind the sandbar at Pak Nam, and thus safe from enemy warships. Among the elite in Siam, attitudes were mixed. The highest military officer in Siam, and the key military advisor to the king, Prince Chakrapong Puanna, and Siam's minister to Paris, Prince Charon Sakti Krikta Kara, favored joining the Entente powers. Prince Paribatha Sukumband, Prince Mahidol Adulya Dej, and Prince Rangsig Puriya Sakdi favored joining Germany. In the end, King Vatia Vu made the decision to enter the war on the Entente side. Siam declared war to serve two key interests. One, to regain the full sovereignty as an equal member of the international community, and two, to dissolve the unequal treaties. There was also some economic benefit to it. By declaring war on Germany, they could now take over all the German property and companies and ships within Siam. Siam declared war on Germany and Austro-Hungary on July the 22nd of 1917, and the immediate effect was quite local. In a well-prepared and well-executed operation, all German and Austro-Hungarian nationals in Siam, around 320 people, were put under guard at daybreak. German ships anchored at Chao Preya were seized, and all German-owned businesses and property and assets were confiscated. In Germany, nine Siamese students were imprisoned at Tsele Castle. Siam decided to send the Siamese Expeditionary Force to Europe, a force consisting of 414 aviation pilots and aircraft mechanics alongside 870 automobile drivers, mechanics, and medical staff assembled. Major General Priya Biya Yarindi had overall command of the expeditionary force, while the Army Air Corps was commanded by Major Lang Tayard Pichard. The Army Combat Vehicle Corps was commanded by Captain Lang Ramarit de Yang, and the Medical Platoon was commanded by Sub Lieutenant Chump Yitmita. They sailed for Marseille, arriving on July the 30th of 1918, but unfortunately for them, tens of thousands of U.S. forces were arriving daily, diminishing their attention. The Siamese Aviation Corps began training at camps in Istres, Le Crotois, La Chapelle, La Ran, Biscayras, and Piax, as the pilots were deemed incapable of withstanding high altitude in air combat. The Siamese Combat Vehicle Corps trained at Camp Lyon, and by October 1918 began to help supply troops using French trucks around Chalon in Champagne. They would be instrumental for transporting Allied troops across the Rhine River in Mainz. On August the 1st, during the Second Battle of the Marne, Major General Feuillet served as an observer. Siamese medical and motor transport detachments were sent to the front and took part in the 1918 Champagne and Meuse-Argonne offensives. 
By the time of the armistice on November the 11th of 1918, the Siamese airmen had not completed their training yet, but the Siamese ground forces had distinguished themselves under fire and were awarded the Croix de Zigao and the Order of Rama decorations. The ground forces participated in the occupation of Neustadt an Had in the Rhinelands and took part in the 1919 Paris Victory Parade. Siam would lose 19 men in World War I, two died before the departure for France, and the remainder from accidents and Spanish flu. Siam participated in the Versailles Peace Conference and became a founding member of the League of Nations. Siam managed to thwart colonialism as the great powers abandoned their extraterritorial interests in Siam. The last surviving member of the Siamese Expeditionary Corps, Yud Sagaguyan, died on October the 9th of 2003 at the age of 106. All right, let's just summarize everything we have now just learned. Many Southeast Asian nations were literally forced to participate, whether it be in a combat role or a labor role during the Great War. This had a profound effect on the people who went to war and came back home with new ideologies. What sprang forth from all of this was a hunger for liberty and freedom from the chains of colonialism. And while it would take quite a long time, freedom would be found one way or another. I really hope you enjoyed this bonus episode, and please let me know more content you want to see from this channel. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button as it feeds these two demon birds who are now my co-hosts. This has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.